Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture on Japanese Americans. The reading talked about the reasons for the early immigration of Japanese Americans. Uh, for instance, the Meiji government's twin strategy of industrialization and militarization resulted in heavy taxes for farmers who are unable to pay which results in thousands of farmers losing their land and they get what they start calling an immigration fever with promises of higher wages in Hawaii and the United States. So that between 1885 and 1924, 200,000 left for Hawaii and 180,000 uh, left for the US mainland. Unlike the Chinese case, <clears throat> Japanese women were able to migrate in large numbers by 1920, they represented 46% of the Japanese population in Hawaii and 35% in California. The 1907 Gentlemen's Agreement excluded the entry of Japanese laborers, yet it permitted the entry of family members. <clears throat> this allowed Japanese women to arrive as brides. The picture, picture bride system was based on the custom of arranged marriages where marriage was a family affair with parents consulting with go-betweens to find suitable partners for their children. Japanese women were wage earners in Japan, so they were also um, used to being outside of the home and participated in the workforce. The Japanese women were also, many of them, educated um, because the Meiji government in Japan encouraged the education of girls. So many of the women who came to the US were already educated and some even learned English in Japan before arriving because uh, learning English language was something that had been added to the curriculum in Japan. So these women are coming, um, having a different experience than when we talked about Chinese American women um, and therefore having different experiences once they arrived to the United States. Now we saw the uh, experiences of Japanese uh, immigrants um, being very different, whether they arrived to Hawaii and settled in Hawaii or whether they um, arrived to the US mainland. So for those that arrived to Hawaii, many worked in sugar plantations there. Um, the sugar plantation owners desired a diverse labor force in order to make it difficult for their workers to communicate with each other and organize into unions. Um, so they were in a way socially engineering their workforce to um, decrease the possibility of having worker unrest and strikes and so on. In this system, white workers held supervisory and skilled uh, work and positions and were often the ones who were overseeing the field workers, um, many of which were Japanese. Um, and Asian immigrant workers were confined to unskilled fields of labor. So there was still sort of this hierarchy being created in terms of uh, racial hierarchy created based on who did what kind of work. In describing the various conditions of work, um, we saw the reading talked about managers threatening violence with whips, uh, workers being dehumanized and addressed by a bango number and not by their names. Um, the environment of working in the fields, in the cane fields where they're tall, um, fields created hot and humid conditions. And this is where they're working for many hours in a day. The housing that is provided in work camps was crowded and unsanitary. So a lot of these workers came because they were uh, promised that they would be transport, their transportation would be paid, housing would be provided, food would be provided, but no one ever described what those things were going to be like. So yes, they were getting paid more than maybe how much they were able to make in Japan, but they um, didn't really have a clear picture of what the work entailed. Yes, they were being provided housing, but that doesn't mean that they weren't provided adequate housing. So these were some of the um, inconsistencies between what they thought they were getting and what the reality turned out to be. Because of some of these realities, we do see examples of resistance being organized by these laborers. 
Um, there is the example of the 1909 Japanese worker strike where they demanded higher wages and equal pay for equal work. 7,000 workers halted operations in Oahu. Uh, they were supported by fellow Japanese laborers and organizations in other islands in Hawaii. And they called for working, they called working conditions or existing working conditions as undemocratic and un-American. So they were actually using um, this kind of language, right? American democratic language, um, language around uh, American fairness to describe their working conditions. And it was a way for them to begin to um, assert and express um, their sense of belonging to the United States. Um, there was also the 1919 strike where 77% of the labor force in Oahu plantations went on strike. And this was a, a strike where there was actually solidarity between Japanese and Filipino workers. Plantation owners responded with propaganda to try to create divisions between the Japanese and Filipino workers. They also used other laborers as strike breakers. And they also um, used strategies such as evicting workers from their homes, which led to 150 of them dying due to being homeless during the flu influenza pandemic of this time period. Their demands included higher wages, an eight hour work week, insurance fund for retired employees, and paid maternity leave. In California, we see a significant difference <clears throat> in, in their experience and in terms of the uh, size of the population. So in, so in California, there were only 2% of the population, yet they were targeted for violence and hostility by white workers. So they actually experienced a lot more racial hostility in California, even though they were a much smaller population there. They turned to farming because of discrimination in other in industries and ended up producing large numbers of California crops. By 1910, they produced 70% of California strawberries. By 1940, they grew 95% of the fresh snap beans, 44% of onions, 67% of tomatoes, and 95% of cel celery. So they were really vital in um, the production of um, <clears throat> fruits and vegetables in uh, this time period. They believe that success in agriculture will lead to acceptance eventually into American uh, society. However, as we saw in the Takao Zawa Supreme Court case, they were still denied citizenship because they were not white. Finally, the reading talked about the second generation, which is called the Nisei generation. Parents believed that their children's citizenship and education would lead to acceptance. Yet Nisei children still experienced racism, being called Japs, told to go back to Japan, for example. And even though they received extensive education, they still dis experienced discrimination in employment. So there were several examples in the reading of a lot of this generation going to universities, scaling college degrees in engineering and science and all sorts of fields, yet not being able to um, put that education into work um, and often having to return to working in the fields or working in other kinds of uh, jobs that were not consistent with the education that they had. So this ends our lecture for this week. I look forward to seeing your comments on the discussion post. Um, have a wonderful week.